first, we're going to invite Ian on stage, and then he's going to invite his colleague James on stage shortly thereafter. So this is a deeply technical talk. Please join me in welcoming Ian to the stage. Hi, everyone. So my name is Ian. I am the operations manager for the core engineering team at Elsevier. Uh, we're a central team which is tasked with driving good practice and uniformity into the production systems that Elsevier use. A lot of the talks today have been about um, large scale, but in large scale single systems. We're slightly different than everyone else uh, who have talked, whereas we have, a, we're very, very large scale in the multi, multi tens of millions of uh, AWS spend a year, but um, it's all very, very diverse, lots and lots of different individual teams. So at Elsevier, we have an AWS first policy. We're two years into a transformation project uh, to migrate on-prem to AWS. And what I'd like to do is take you through the journey that we've been on to increase what we call operational maturity at Elsevier. So first of all, I'd like to show you an example of a traditional software house setup. In our software house, they might have a single AWS account, one or more VPCs inside that account, several affiliated development teams working on different aspects of the solution that they're delivering. And each VPC has various different environments, uh, development teams push to development, integration, and then into production. So it's fairly straightforward. One product with one end goal. Reasonably simple to run config management and infrastructure um, as code tools. So we're a little bit different, like I say. We have a single dev team. We'll have at least two accounts, a production account and a non-prod account. The, each account will have one or more VPCs, and the dev workflow is like this. So you can look at that and go, well, that's not that different. That's two accounts rather than one, but it uh, doesn't seem so hard. Except we have a lot more accounts, a huge amount of accounts. All of them are different development teams, all working on different applications, all have different requirements for infrastructure, for monitoring, and for release. And we are a central team who is tasked with driving conformity and governance in this uh, rather uh, diverse landscape. So it gives us it's a very, very conservative estimate, 40 development teams. Many of those teams are split into multiple teams themselves. They each have two to three AWS accounts. Each account will have one to six VPCs. And that gives us a grand total of 90 AWS accounts. If we include backup accounts into that, that puts it up to about 140, uh, with a total of 300 odd VPCs. Now, how do we manage this? All these different accounts, um, every one of them is different. Every one of them has different requirements from the dev teams, but somehow, as a core team, we have to build them all so that they're not all special snowflakes requiring hundreds of operations engineers and people to manage them. We could put fairly rigid uh, restrictions on this and say, oh, you can only do this, you can only do that, but those days are really gone. I mean, you know, the days when we had ops teams who owned production and, uh, you know, you could only push a release on the first Tuesday of the month or if you wanted a server, it would take a month to deliver it. Uh, you know, they're all gone. Developers want, they work in agile practices, they want to be able to push regularly and often. So we had to come up with a new method of management and a way to communicate this to the business. Um, and we called this operational maturity. Uh, we defined five pillars of operational maturity. We said, what do we want as ops people to be able to say, I'm happy with this. I'm ha this, is a real, this, this is what good looks like for production. And it gave us, from this, we could pull out a load of requirements, and we could then socialize those requirements to people and say, you know, this is what, this is what we want from things this, to make something, to say that something is operationally mature. And then we set about building a platform so that we could deliver this. So the five pillars are infrastructure governance, which is the definition of you know, delivery of solid, reliable infrastructure. Release deployment governance, which is the function of automated and repeatable and consistent releases. Configuration management, quantifying and codifying all variables in your environment. Security governance, definition and delivery of secure ways of operating. And health monitoring, uh, reliable and consistent health monitoring so that we know the state of the services that operations are traditionally responsible for. So I'm going to run you through those and give you a, an idea of the 
policies around those, and then later on uh, James will come up and he will dive in much more technical detail, which is uh, way beyond my head, uh, over my head, um, about how we have delivered some of these. So infrastructure governance is where we want to ensure that the infrastructure is well built and maintained. We said that there was a path to production, and that was a set of environments that code would go through. Each environment would have a particular function, like a test. It would be user testing, it would be QA, it would be regression testing, whatever it would be. That was specific and understood, and code moved through those environments to reach production. Obviously, to do that, those environments had to be... We had to know what those environments were. So often, when you get snowflake environments, they, you know and you get something released into production and it behaves entirely different to what it did in its staging environment, people say, oh yeah, that's because staging isn't the same as production. Well, it has to be. Uh, and otherwise you do not have uh, confidence in what you're releasing to production. So what is good in production? Base infrastructure consistency. Got to be the same. Gives us loads of things. Same setup, same pattern, same deployment method. That gives us a lot of things. It gives us this confidence in our production releases. But it also means that all these different environments, like I say, these 140-odd accounts, they, the ops team, we don't have to have tribal knowledge for every single account, and it's, uh, they, they have a, an underlying similarity. Uh, automated and repeatable infrastructure deployments. We are completely a Terraform house. We deploy through Jenkins jobs, all of our Terraform. Uh, everything is under source control. We are... Very fanatical about that. James will go into a bit more detail with it, uh, how we have our coding practices and what we do. I mean, this is all great, but how do we do that in our huge and, I mean, willfully diverse environments? If you put three developers in a room to come up with a CI pipeline they want, they will come up with six different CI pipelines. It's just the nature of the beast. So how do we ensure governance without these over, overly restrictive controls? You know, as soon as we start to say, right, you can only use this tool it's just not going to fly in Elsevier. We know they won't do it. Um, and, of course, we can't have gateways and you know, JIRA tickets and all this sort of thing. It just, it just doesn't work in uh, modern day. So we came up with a modular Terraform infrastructure. Everything is Terraformed. We created our Terraform as building blocks. And the reason for this is that each, so each building block has its... They slot together. They know, what they know how to talk to each other. They have an internal consistency and governance. But what it does is it allows development teams to just pick and choose what they want. And this is the important difference. A development team might want solar cluster, so they can just pick that. They might want a logging framework, so they can pick that. They might want a puppet in there. Uh, that's one of the core ones, so they generally have to have that. Um, but each building block references each other and provides a consistent whole without the need to understand the nuances of what you're building. We didn't, we didn't want developers to have to worry about, I don't know, how to build Puppet or how to um, build uh, a VPC because they would come up with 20 different ways of doing it. So it's just a case of, here's a block, put that in, include that, and away you go. This structure allows us to do this. So for an account, which they are large, all of our accounts are very large, 90% of the code that makes up the infrastructure comes directly from central module code. Developers never touch it. They just pull it in. We have very, very consistent uh, code standards, readmes and so on. Very easy to follow. 7% of it is boilerplate, variables, just uh, imports and so on, stuff to stick everything together. And only 3% is specific to the environment. In our environments, we're averaging about 30,000 lines of Terraform for an environment. And that shows you there that, in effect, to set up an environment of 30,000 lines, you're looking at only having to write 1,000 lines of code. And it's just variables and so on. It's a, it allows people to concentrate on what they want and let the uh, infrastructure do the rest for them. The next uh, piece of uh, operational maturity was uh, release deployment governance. Again, automated, repeatable, and consistent releases. We had some teams that internal to the teams. They had three or four different methods of releasing. And uh, there was just no way that, an, uh, that a central operations team could uh, come in there and at three o'clock in the morning go, all oh, right, well, so this is this one, so I need to release like this. Oh, no, it's... And we had to get to some level of consistency. So, again, we 
did this by creating building blocks and people just pull those building blocks in. So it's a defined and managed path to production. It get, these building blocks give them this without, without having to think about it, it just gives them this. All aspects of the deployment are the same for all releases in the lead up to production. With these two things, teams have a high degree of confidence in their release pipeline, and again, the developer doesn't have to worry too much about it. Built into all of our Terraform release modules are rollback testing. It's, it's all part of that, so it's very easy to roll forward and roll back without them having to worry about, oh, how do I do that? How do I manage it? Uh, release deployment governance also encompasses the ease of deployment, so automated de release jobs. Again, we use Jenkins to do this, and we have skeleton repositories and example repositories for things like blue-green releases or rolling releases or even red-black if people are okay with that. And they just pull these in, slot in a few variables, and away they go. Again, it's all about making the developers there so they have the choice what to do, but they don't have to worry about how it all fits together. Configuration management, quantifying and codifying our variables. So configuration management on all path to production environments. The role of CF, some envir environments are different, things like size of environments, size of I know, memory usage, Java heap size, all that sort of thing. But as long as you know what the differences are, then you know, it's fine. And we use Hira in a, you know, very heavily to make sure that we understand all the environment di di differences are deliberate and understood. And by using this, uh, building blocks for Puppet and Jenkins, teams gain all of this without the need for much thought. They can just run Puppet, run Jenkins, and it's there all ready for them. Security governance. I think this is the biggest driver uh, for change in companies in cl using cloud in the next 10 years. I, obviously, everyone's heard about the NHS issue. I think it's going to just get worse, and companies need a wake-up call. It just really isn't considered from, for product teams. They just don't consider it more often than not. They don't have mandatory testing of, of security and so on. And again, so we took the approach that you know, product teams have a passing acquaintance with security, but that's it. So put it all under the hood. So we have things like, we have an AMI bakery. It delivers hardened images. Every time there is a critical security update or there is a kernel uh, release for all of our OSs, the AMI bakery automatically spins up a new AMI, gets shared out to every account. We have Terraform modules that pick up the latest one and it's into production and done. We have network ACLs configured through our base Terraform modules, trying to keep up to date with the thousands of developers that we have to say, please don't spin up a Jenkins, which is open to the world, is, is, is a hiding to nothing. It will never work. So we just have knuckles there, and it doesn't matter. They, you know, it's, they're set up, and it's all about that which isn't express, expressly allowed is denied, your standard firewall rules. And um, if they wanted something that isn't in there, then they have to actually go and change it. Uh, we have security logging. Again, we have an ISDP, a, it's a security team. They want particular logs for um, security events. Just install that uh, building block and they don't have to worry about it. The security gets logged to ISDP and they can then see what's going on. Uh, and we use configuration management for SSH key management. It gives us a central place to store, store keys rather than just keys going around randomly, and people leave and the key is still there and so on. And then finally, health monitoring. Health monitoring, you know, a reliable and consistent way to clearly understand the health of any service. Now, this is probably the least automated. The, the provision of the health monitoring is extremely automated. Everything through Terraform and Puppet, going to CloudWatch. Um, it's one of the most sought after functions of an ops team, is 24 seven support, but it's also true that it's probably the least loved area of product development. Uh, you know, it works fine on my machine, is, uh, still exists today. So we knew that monitoring had to be something that would require minimum effort from the product teams. So all systems go through a health review. We, this has to be manual because of all our systems are different, but we look at everything, look at how it, how it works, all the different connections, all the different egress and ingress points, and we have standard Puppet and Terraform modules that just can just be slotted straight in and it all gets built. So all of the AWS health monitoring is all part of Terraform. It's all really good. All of our alerts say this is wrong, not something is wrong. I'm not interested in knowing that the CPU has gone high. I'm not interested in knowing that the site is down, certainly. I'm interested in knowing why the CPU has gone high or 
and knowing long before the site goes down itself. So we're really extensive on run books with UIDs. So, you know, that three o'clock in the morning, bleary eyed, the operator gets a, an alert and they see a UID, they just go directly to that UID and there's the associated, here's where you log in, here's your uh, testing, here's your pre-remediation and so on. And we monitor through CloudWatch. Now, CloudWatch is not ideal, but we started off, we were looking at having Sensu and all this lovely, wonderful stuff, and we realized that we were building a, a pro another production system, which was actually more important than the production systems it was monitoring. So, uh, because if that went down, we wouldn't know where we were. So, we're currently in CloudWatch. We are, eventually, we'll move on probably to something else. CloudWatch has, has its uh, problems. Um, but all alerts, all the, all the custom metrics deployed via Puppet, alerts are managed by Lambdas, which are deployed via Terraform. So how does this work on the ground? So I say I run the core engineering team. We are a central team, and the bulk of the strategy and the work is done by the core engineering team of six people. This work, we deliver these modules and the different repos and so on, like I say, which James will go into in more detail. This work is primarily consumed by the ops teams, the implementation teams, the people who are doing the transformation projects, the people who are doing the day-to-day -day work. They take this code. We heavily encourage them because we have our standards are very, very well-defined. We heavily encourage them to help contribute and contribute things back in. And the same works. Some application teams don't have any ops or implementation. They want to do it themselves, so the development teams can do the same thing. Obviously we encourage feedback. The main sticking point that we have for this is it's, it's uptake. There is no point us writing all this wonderful stuff and patting ourselves on the back saying, God, isn't this absolutely awesome if no one's going to use it? So this is why we, um, we are a central team where we are very much all about communication. So I'm now going to pass you over to James Russell. He's my principal uh, engineer, and he will talk in much more detail in the technical aspects of some of the things I've uh, mentioned. I'm only going to do a couple of slides on our bakery. Um, I'm assuming probably quite a fair few people have their own. Um, so we did a survey not too long ago. We found that in our accounts there are around 13 different hundred AMIs. Um, and that's AMIs running. Uh, that isn't just stored AMIs. Uh, so we really need to get that down. So we have uh, an AMI bakery. It's built using Packer, of course. We use Puppet, uh, some bash scripting, uh, and we use Jenkins. If you don't use Jenkins pipelines and Jenkins firewalls, I'd highly recommend doing that. So for legacy reasons, we need to support four different Linux distributions. Um, we're hoping to reduce this down. As Ian mentioned, we were only about two years through this project, so it's hard to get everyone on the same page at the moment. We also, at the beginning, decided that we'd only support HVM instances, so, so that was an easy choice for us. And every day, we run a canary build of each type of our operating systems that we support. Um, that will then check if there's any critical package upgrades or whether there are uh, any kernel patches. Uh, the canary build way is a lot better, we found, than trying to uh, subscribe to the various security bulletins. Um, and so if we don't find any patches, the job finishes, and we wait till the next day. If there are critical patches or kernel updates, then we continue the build. Uh, and Puppet will harden our AMI using a CIS benchmarking standard, and that will happen every day if we, if we need to. So before an AMI becomes an, a real AMI that we distribute out, we run a full suite of server spec testing. We don't allow anything on our bakery that doesn't have uh, a form of test. The, the whole bakery, the whole system, it's fully monitored. Uh, it's completely automated. We have modules, Terraform modules that launch this. Um, we, I can launch the entire AMI bakery and the subsidiary services in a couple of minutes. When we build our AMI, we share it to a lot of our most popular regions. We also share it to uh, every AWS accountant that we know of. It's trying to make developers use it. Um, they have no, no excuse if it's there. So now I'm going to talk about Terraform. Um, Nikki's kind of uh, presentation previously was uh, we've been exactly through that process. And so this is actually going to build quite nicely on that to what we've ended up having uh, and how we manage it in some form. So we started off two years ago, and we literally terraformed all the things. Terraform is the foundation of anything that we do in Amazon. I haven't been on a project in the past two years, really, which hasn't involved some form of Terraform. And that includes when I've been doing more development-driven projects. Um, there is still a part of uh, a Terraform to deploy my application within that. 
And with the infrastructure as code space being a bit kind of cramped, I just wanted to give you a quick idea of why we chose it. It may not be right for you, but this is the reasons why we chose it. So whenever we do a, a big kind of project or we're looking at a new technology, we do a proof of concept. And so two, two and a half years ago, we looked at Troposphere, Asgard, Terraform cloud formation. Um, and Terraform really has a low barrier to entry. Um, if you have some experience running your services with your cloud provider, it's pretty easy to write some Terraform to take over that management. The real kind of biggest stumbling block is knowing, for example, an ASG needs a launch configuration and to scale it, you need CloudWatch alarms. With that, the documentation is excellent um, and the community is great. It's a, it's a, I found it personally a very easy tool to pick up. Cloud agnostic, at Elsevier, we do have a Amazon first policy. It doesn't mean to say that we're not going to use a different cloud provider for, for DR, for backup or just because that product has a real specific need. And so we needed to consider that, and Terraform provide, allows us to write the exact same code using the same principles for a different provider, say Azure or uh, Google. Maybe a bit obvious, having it within version control as code. Um, we did actually look at Asgard because it would have fitted nicely. We have got a lot of legacy infrastructure that may be in Amazon but isn't managed very well, and Asgard would have been good to put in. Um, but we pretty much vetoed that. We want it with code. We want the code to sit next to the application. We want to create the pipelines for it. So our modules. Modules are pretty much, in my opinion, the only way to run Terraform at scale and is the way I would do it even if I was running a single environment. It's just the way to go. So currently, we have about 60 modules. Um, these are core modules. They're reusable. They are highly reliable. And they're designed to work across as many development teams as we can possibly do. We try to write them with dry principles. That can be a little tough with a declarative language. Each, model will, each module will build everything it needs to run. That includes its security groups, SSM documents, IAM roles and policies. It means that if we actually get rid of that piece of infrastructure, it will take everything with it. We're not left with any security holes or any costs that we may not need. And as I said, we do everything in Terraform. Um, on the transformation projects we do, um, there is nothing allowed into the account that is not in Terraform. And so this is kind of a cross-section of the modules we have. Um, it gives a feel for the variety that we've got and how we try to cover everything through modules. This includes the VPC and the bashing builds, but also the really kind of the core things. So the account bootstrap and the state locking. These are configured immediately when a new account's created. Um, and this is a, an area where Terraform has kind of helped out more than the, just the devs or the operations team. Our account management team now have a Jenkins pipeline where it will bootstrap Terraform for them. They can put the required information in and it will go and do the work. And at the end, we have a fresh bootstrapped Terraform account. The same goes for InfoSec or for our cost focus teams. Within the account bootstrap module, we can put the roles they require to run their auditing. As Ian mentioned, we've got an example and a skeleton repositories. Um, rather than have numerous development teams, numerous people come up to us and ask us, how should I do this? We just codify it. It's so easy, and people can use this as the basis. The skeleton control repo as well. I'll talk a bit more about the control repos later. But again, this is what we use in our pipeline. It gives people an example to, to build off. Health monitoring. Uh, we've got really lightweight, simple modules that uh, can do basic Amazon monitoring. There's really no excuse why a product team can't deploy something that doesn't have some basic monitoring in place. It's so simple to do. As I said, with our AMI bakery, uh, that's also through Terraform. So we've got a reporting AMI and a report submission framework. Uh, everything we do, even that type of thing, is done through Terraform. And the final couple of ones, so the AMI and the Puppet server, they're the ones that really tie up our platform. The AMI uh, module uses our discovery API, and so that people can use this module and they can, it will automatically discover the latest AMI so they know they don't have to pick a, an AMI from a list. The Puppet server as well, um, we use Puppet as our CMS. The Puppet server can bootstrap itself in 10 minutes. So again, a team doesn't have to worry about how to manage their Puppet server. They can use this and they can just get a Puppet server. So how do we manage our modules? We've got quite a few. Uh, so management is quite important to us. We develop them in a, a very similar way to Terraform, any kind of open source software. So we use semantic versioning and we've got change logs so that people know exactly what's going to be changing and what we've done with the module. If it isn't documented, it really doesn't exist. It aims to lower the barrier to entry but it, and allow people to understand exactly what's going on. But also, readmes aren't good enough, so we have uh, what we term a platform the hard way. It's a lab-style walkthrough which 
allow someone that's maybe new to the tool or new to the process, it takes them through nine labs, and at the end of it, they'll actually have an example app deployed with full monitoring and a puppet server. Uh, and it's a, it's a really good way to onboard people. We have pretty rigorous code standards reviews. Um, any change to a module has to, have, has to be approved by one core member. A change in functionality or a new module will have to have two core members approve that change. Um, we try to encourage as much feedback as possible. If our module isn't doing something which a development team think it should be, we want them to tell us. We're not, we're not precious about our code, and if it's not going to fit their purpose, it's likely it won't fit someone else's purpose either. And we had a problem with fringe modules uh, in the past. So maybe a, a team has written their own module. Um, they've named it roughly similar to how we do our naming convention, but it lacks best practice. We haven't approved it. So what we have is we have a maturity ratings on our modules. They go from high to low. Uh, a high module is something that we've approved, is in active development, and has all the best practices. A low module is something that we found is probably untested, that just lacks our best practice guidelines. Well, along with that, we have our modules in a, a very restricted Git location. Um, it's not to lower inclusion. It's not to say, hey, these are mine. I, I'm the best at writing them. You can't touch them. Um, it's to stop. If someone has access to the master, um, they may do something wrong for the right reason. And that's not their fault. That's my fault. Uh, and that might bring in some unexpected kind of situations. Um, and so having them in a restrictive location forces that person down our work path, even if they don't have any idea of what that is. So this is uh, an example of one of our modules. This is our module that deploys our container platform. Um, that is built off Nomad and Console. I don't have time to go into that right now, but if anyone wants to talk about that after, come and grab me. And if you use it, I'd be really interested to talk to you. You'll see that we've got our code clearly separated in this module. Um, it may seem overkill the way we do it, but this module is well over 1,000 lines of code, and the security file is well over 300, probably about 400 lines. All our variables are scoped by the module name. So you'll see here that we have uh, the variable container underscore around, and that will be the same throughout the module, so you know what you're getting. Somewhat against what is the HTL style guide for multi-line comments, we use banners. Um, we started off with it, and it worked really well for us. And with that, we run Terraform format against all our modules. Um, if a tool provides a formatting inbuilt function, let's use it. It means that I'm not going to argue with a team member because we, th we think that we should use spaces against tabs or something like that. This is what it deploys. It's not particularly supposed to be clear, but I wanted to show what lies underneath that one module. So what that module deploys is 50 pieces of infrastructure, um, which is how you, however you do it, 50 API calls, or if you're really into that kind of thing, uh, 50 console clicks. And what it means is the person that's deploying this doesn't have to have really in-depth knowledge about how this works. They don't need to know what TCP or what UDP ports to open up. They can trust that the people that developed this module did that hard work, discovered that, and they can just deploy it and not have to get quite to grips with that level with it. We once got asked about that, actually, going back. Um, me and a colleague demonstrated our container platform to someone uh, over in the States. And we were asked, why would I use your Terraform modules? Why wouldn't I just roll my own? Um, and I think this actually demonstrates why you wouldn't do it, because you, it's just a mess. So now we've got all of our modules. How do we deploy them out into, into our environment? So we have something that we call control repos. They're very similar in their design to Puppet Hero, and that was one of the bases of our design. Um, and each product or development team, however it's kind of loosely figured out, will have their own control repository. They have a simple but quite strict directory structure. It allows anyone that's working on it to quickly understand what's deployed, what environments there are, and things like that. And they should only ever import a module. We don't allow any direct resource declarations in the control repository. If someone has a module and they think that there should be an additional resource to that module, generally enough, that should actually go back into the module and we feed that back. Um, we don't find that most of the infrastructure differs, ver differs greatly. Um, the requirements for the core infrastructure are pretty similar, and so, so we can get away with that, and it fits quite well for us. All our imports are pinned to the Git tag when, with the semantic versioning. We get no surprises when modules are changed, uh, and changes can be tested throughout the environment, so through development, staging, integration into production. And this is one that we have deployed. So this is an example of our control directory. So at the top level, we uh, split it by the account number. And then within there, uh, we split it by the environment. So you'll see here we have common and live. So common is a, a special reserved area within our directory structure. That 
configures things that are a global service and are not restricted to a particular environment. So that will do things such as the password policy, uh, critical assumed roles, and things like that, and they live in there. Again, we split out our database. Uh, it's the only thing that won't go in the, di in the live directory. We have a separate DB directory. That is just to protect it. We try to keep it away so people don't touch it as much, uh, just so that that critical piece of infrastructure is, is kept away in its own state file. It's, it's the precious thing. And if we go into that live directory, what do we have? This is something that's been written. This is a real example. This is deployed. So 24 modules are imported. Nine of those are actually monitoring modules. So you can see how Terraform and our modular infrastructure actually helps it makes, make it easier for us to deploy monitoring. There are some modules which are specific to the product, so the API and the news feed, for example. If we try to write a module that could be used by every development team to deploy their application, we would effectively just be writing a wrapper around the wrapper. So development teams in conjunction with us and the implementation team will generally write custom modules for the application. We don't find it helpful to, uh, to write a module. It's just a wrapper. I won't show you the graph for this one. It would probably hurt everyone's eyes. Um, secondly, when I did the graphing for this, I was interested to try and upload it to PowerPoint to see what it looked like. PowerPoint wouldn't actually upload it, so it saved you. And these are just a couple of got years that we have with the control repo. So the first one is referencing variables that could clearly be dynamically created. Um, it might be hard to know what your module should be outputting at the beginning, but with the way we do our, our development, our release cycle, if you have something that's put in, it, it's very obvious. And so we have that, and it's a lot better. It's much neater, dynamic generated, less code. Something as well, uh, which Nikki actually touched on and gave the example of variables referencing a variable that's meant for something else. So here you will see that we are setting up our container agent uh, instance here, but we're actually assigning that to the Jenkins master instance here. That may be because someone doesn't know quite how it works. It may be because that person is lazy, but it's actually quite confusing. Uh, it can create a lot of problems. Um, if someone changes that module, uh, that variable, they're actually going to impact two modules without knowing it. Uh, that can cause uh, unexplained side effects and, and possibly outages in the long run. And so what we have, we just have correctly assigned variables. It may be a little bit more code, but in the, f in the long term, it's going to be a much better way to manage your code. And so going to our future, um, I'm going to pass back to Ian. Ian is the one that always tells me what to do, and so it's probably best that he tells you about what our future entails. So we're this core team that we've talked about. The, and the whole point of this is being able to drive operational maturity without having to keep banging on to product teams, oh, you must put this in, you must put this in. It's just there for them. But obviously, this won't work if people don't use it. And we need to continue to lower the barrier of entry even further. It is low now, but we need to keep going. We need to expand our platform. So at the moment, we need to have certainly uh, things like better testing to facilitate people being able to commit into our code, but also to make sure that it's, that it's valid and long before it gets to production. Security. Uh, we need to do things like federation. We need to do things like have uh, secrets management with Vault and so on. All of it needs to happen. And cost op optimization. Elsevier was, it was very much the transformation project was, let's get everything out of the data center into the cloud. We'll worry about cost later. Now they're starting to worry about cost, so everything is cost optimized. And finally, we need to adopt Terraform Enterprise. A lot of the stuff we've done is working around the edges, and some of the new stuff that's coming out in Terraform Enterprise, I think, will really, really help us. Uh, the, their model of consumers and uh, so on is really, really useful for us, and it will work well in our environment. So that's something that I'm sure will make some of the sales guys happy here. Um, so to continue the Lego theme, everything uh, we do starts off with the Terraform module. The core engineering team believes that Lincoln summed it up very well. Terraform is the greatest infrastructure provisioning tool of our era. Thank you very much. <laughs>